I thought I understood how carbon dioxide emissions cause global warming. Turned out I got it completely wrong. I was about to sweep my misunderstanding under the carpet. But then I thought, what if I'm not the only one? What if we're all just pretending to kind of understand something we're spending trillions of dollars on? Maybe I should talk about it after all. So how does the greenhouse effect really work? How do we know that global warming is caused by humans? And what predictions have climate models ever made? That's what we'll talk about today. Here's what I learned in middle school about the greenhouse effect. A literal greenhouse works like this. Glass lets most sunlight through. When the sunlight hits the ground of the greenhouse or a tomato or why are you socks in the greenhouse, Dennis? Then the sunlight gets absorbed and re-emitted at longer wavelengths in the infrared. We can't see this infrared light, but we can feel it. It feels warm. But glass acts like a mirror for light in the infrared. Here is an image of a man with a plastic bag over his hands wearing glasses. On the left, you see a normal photo taken with visible light. On the right, you see an image taken with infrared light. With the infrared light, you can see through the plastic bag, but you can no longer see through the glasses. So all that glass in a greenhouse traps the infrared radiation and that warms the air. You actually don't need air in a greenhouse for that to work, except that the air is the thing that you want to warm up. And also tomatoes don't grow in vacuum. That's how an actual greenhouse works. Now here's how I thought this works for our planet. Much like glass, the atmosphere of Earth is transparent to most of the light that comes from the sun. Some of the light is absorbed in the upper atmosphere and some is reflected, but most of the light is absorbed by the surface of Earth. This heats up the surface, which in return emits light in the infrared. The infrared light, however, doesn't travel through the atmosphere that easily, because some molecules in the air absorb it. These are the so-called greenhouse gases, of which carbon dioxide is one. More carbon dioxide leads to more absorption of this infrared radiation, which warms up the planet. Simple enough. But what if I told you... What if I told you that the infrared light which comes from the surface of the Earth is absorbed by greenhouse gases, not way up there in the atmosphere, but after 20 meters or so? Because that's what happens. Pretty much none of the infrared radiation goes through Earth's atmosphere already at the current carbon dioxide levels. If the levels increase further, then the distance that the light makes it from the surface decreases a bit more, but so what? It never made it out anyway. It's all a hoax! Bring back coal! Okay, here's the truth. The greenhouse effect isn't quite that simple. So let's try this again. This time we add some high school physics and see if that makes any more sense. Sunlight contains many different frequencies, but not in equal amounts. Frequency, as a reminder, is proportional to the energy of the light. So higher frequency means higher energy. And frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength of light. A longer wavelength means lower energy. If one plots the amount of light as a function of its frequency, one gets what's called a spectrum. The spectrum of the sun looks roughly like this. It doesn't change all that much in the visible range, which is why the sun looks pretty much white if you look at it. Which you shouldn't. Because keep in mind, Isaac Newton did it and we're still making fun of him today. But this spectrum isn't specific to the sun. The spectrum of any object at a constant temperature has a shape like this. The surface of the sun has a temperature of about 5000 degrees Celsius, but the higher the temperature, the more the spectrum shifts to higher frequencies and the more energy the body emits. And the lower the temperature, the lower the average frequencies, the longer the wavelength and the less energy is emitted. It's called Planck's law. If you know the temperature, then Planck's law tells you what light is emitted and how much energy is emitted in total. If sunlight hits the socks in the greenhouse or the surface of Earth, it's absorbed and re-emitted. And as we just saw, the radiation spectrum depends on the temperature. But what's the temperature of Earth? Well, Earth gets a certain amount of sunlight from the sun and with that a certain amount of energy. 
the temperature of Earth increases until the total energy that's emitted is the same as what comes from the Sun. When energy in is the same as energy out, the system is in balance and it doesn't change any further. This means one can calculate the temperature of the surface of a planet from the amount of sunlight it receives. If Earth didn't have an atmosphere, its surface temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. Good news if you're selling spiced pumpkin latte, but most of us like it somewhat warmer. Luckily, Earth does have an atmosphere and that keeps us warm. This works as follows. Molecules resonate when light of certain frequencies hits them, and then they begin to wiggle. This converts the energy of light into motion of molecules. So the molecules trap the light, basically, and convert it into heat. But most air molecules don't wiggle for infrared light. The atmosphere of Earth is more than 99% nitrogen, oxygen and argon, and none of them are good infrared wigglers. I mean, we can breathe oxygen, all right, that's nice, but it does nothing to keep us warm. Greenhouse gases, on the other hand, are great infrared wigglers. The infrared light hits them, they wiggle, and those wiggling molecules then bump into other air molecules, which distributes the energy in the air. Every once in a while, one of those molecules also emits infrared radiation again, which spreads it throughout the atmosphere. The most relevant greenhouse gases on Earth are water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane. If you put a layer of air with greenhouse gas around a planet, then this infrared radiation is absorbed by the air. That heats up the air and that emits some radiation again and so on. So the infrared radiation slowly spreads through the atmosphere from the surface up. But if you go to higher and higher altitudes, the air gets thinner. Even if the concentration of a greenhouse gas stays the same, the total amount of greenhouse gas per volume still drops. And eventually there's so little greenhouse gas that the infrared radiation can escape to outer space. This means that most of the infrared radiation which leaves our planet doesn't come from the surface. It comes from an altitude of several kilometers above the surface. Again, the temperature of the radiation has to balance the energy that comes in from the sun. And since temperature decreased with altitude, this means that the temperature further down on the surface of the planet must increase. This is how the greenhouse effect really works. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere prevent infrared radiation from the surface from going right into space. Instead, the infrared radiation that goes into space comes from the upper atmosphere. That radiation from the upper atmosphere has to balance the influx of energy from the sun. And since the temperature of the atmosphere decreases with altitude, the surface of the planet has to reach a much higher temperature than without greenhouse gases. Hey, I got it! Well, actually, this isn't how it works either. Or rather, this is how the big planetary greenhouse effect works in general. It's the reason why our planet has an average surface temperature of 16 degrees Celsius and not minus 18. But it's not the reason for the enhanced greenhouse effect which currently causes climate change. Because the temperature of the atmosphere only decreases up to an altitude of about 10 kilometers or so. If you go further up, it remains constant for a bit, and then the temperature actually begins to increase again. That's because the atmosphere up there absorbs some of the incoming sunlight. This part of the atmosphere where the temperature increases is called the stratosphere. I'll have more to say about this later, so keep it in mind. Now remember that the greenhouse effect works because pushing the effective altitude of emission up reduces the temperature of emission and that brings the system out of balance. But what if I told you? What if I told you that carbon dioxide at pre-industrial levels already pushes the effective altitude of emission up into the stratosphere? If you further increase the carbon dioxide level after that, the altitude of emission doesn't change any further because the temperature of the atmosphere doesn't change. It seems that the warming effect is already saturated at the current level. So I guess we're back to it's all a hoax. 
Okay, to understand what's really going on, we have to add one more subtlety. It's that all those greenhouse gases don't absorb infrared light equally well at all wavelengths. They absorb light only in certain parts of the infrared spectrum. The best absorber is water vapor. That's because the water molecule has a lot of resonances. It's a really, really good infrared wiggler. If we look at Earth from above in the infrared and add the absorption from water vapor, then the spectrum changes roughly like this. You can think about this as an increase of the effective altitude of emission again, but a slightly different altitude for different wavelengths. For example, at shorter wavelengths, the light comes on average from an altitude of about 4 kilometers. At longer wavelengths, it's more like 5 kilometers. And each of those altitudes have their own effective temperature, which you see on those two sides. Carbon dioxide now has a much stronger absorption, but it's only in a specific part of the spectrum. This is around a wavelength of about 15 micrometers. The relevance of carbon dioxide for our climate comes from this emission band being pretty much near the peak of the infrared emission. At pre-industrial levels, carbon dioxide takes out a big chunk of radiation coming from the surface of Earth. This lower part of the absorption line, that's the emission curve that belongs to the temperature at the average altitude of emission, about 220 Kelvin or minus 60 degrees Celsius. But here's the thing. If you increase the carbon dioxide level even more, then this ditch can't get deeper, because the temperature at that altitude doesn't drop any further. If you've ever had the pleasure of interacting with the climate change denier, this is Exhibit A. Look, they'll say, nothing we do will make any difference. And it's indeed correct that the bottom of the ditch basically won't change much. But this isn't the relevant part. The relevant part is that carbon dioxide doesn't just absorb light in this very narrow range. It also absorbs it to both of those sides, and in fact in some other parts of the spectrum which I haven't drawn. If the concentration of carbon dioxide increases further, then the emission of more and more wavelengths in the spectrum moves up to higher altitude, so they move to lower temperatures, which in this figure means that the ditch gets wider. So increasing carbon dioxide levels filters out an increasingly bigger chunk of the wavelength window that we use to cool the planet. Another way to put it is that when carbon dioxide levels increase, more and more of the infrared radiation is emitted from higher altitudes, where the temperature is lower, which makes the cooling increasingly less efficient. And then the surface of the planet will warm until the energy balance is re-established. This carbon dioxide ditch doesn't get wider by a lot, it's just a tiny bit. But this is the major reason for the enhanced greenhouse effect that we're seeing right now. Can such a small difference really have so big consequences? Well, if you think about it, global warming is a small effect in absolute terms. The average temperature of Earth is something like 290 Kelvin. We're talking about a change of a few degrees Kelvin. That's a percent difference. Not a big change for the planet, but a big change for us, because we've made ourselves comfortable on this planet with a different climate. The full story, you won't be surprised to hear, is vastly more complicated than this 20 minutes YouTube video suggests. That's because besides carbon dioxide, there's also methane and water vapor, and the temperature in the upper atmosphere isn't actually constant in that region, but that's roughly what's going on. This tells us another thing. Remember I said that as you go up to higher altitudes in the atmosphere, the temperature increases again in a region called the stratosphere. This is because the stratosphere absorbs some of the incoming sunlight, especially in the ultraviolet. The concentration of greenhouse gases up there isn't high enough anymore to trap the incoming infrared light. But the concentration of carbon dioxide is still increasing. What does this do to the stratosphere? Well, these additional greenhouse gas molecules will still emit infrared light when they wiggle. This means that the stratosphere becomes better at getting rid of energy, which means it cools. This is called stratospheric cooling, and it's one of the key predictions that climate models have made. It was predicted already in 1967 by Manabe and Weatherald. Weatherald died in 2011, 
Manabe was one of the recipients of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics. This figure from their 1967 paper shows that when carbon dioxide levels increase, the lower atmosphere should warm, but the stratosphere should cool. This was a super important prediction because of global warming was caused by an increase in solar radiation rather than by more greenhouse gases, then they should both warm. And the upper stratosphere has in fact cooled. Here's a summary of the data from some satellites up there. What happened in 1991? That was the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. So if someone asks you what predictions climate models have ever made, a good answer is stratospheric cooling. And if someone asks you how we know it's not a change in solar radiation, a good answer is also stratospheric cooling. I've tried to figure out why I misunderstood this for so long, and I think what threw me off is all those arrows for infrared light that go right through the atmosphere. I think it'd be better to draw it like this. The incoming radiation from the sun goes through the atmosphere and hits the surface. It's converted into infrared radiation and that heats the atmosphere from below. Somewhere up here, the infrared light escapes for good. If the concentration of carbon dioxide goes up, then the infrared light escapes from somewhat further up, where the atmosphere is a little colder. So now the total emitted energy is smaller and the system is out of balance. The Earth then has to heat from below until the emission comes into balance again. And the effective altitude of emission can be slightly different for each part of the frequency spectrum. I believe that those pictures originate from illustrations in climate physics books where the arrows don't depict the way that the radiation actually goes, but just the total amount of energy that flows through those channels. That's to say, this illustration is all well and fine, so long as you don't think this means that the infrared light actually goes through the atmosphere. I learned all this from a great book by Raymond Pierre Humbert, which I would like to show you, but it's got green on the cover. Can you turn off the chroma key for a moment? Here's the book. And yeah, this is how the sausages are made. It's just a piece of green cloth pinned to the wall. Many thanks also to Adam Levy for helping with this video. Adam has his own YouTube channel where he talks about climate stuff. If you're interested in that, go check it out. Was my explanation of any use? Let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video, which you got to watch for free because it was sponsored by NordVPN. So please hear me out while I tell you why we work with them. NordVPN is an app that you install on your phone or laptop. It creates a secure connection to one of their servers and then you browse the web from there. This keeps your data private, even on a public wireless. NordVPN also comes with a threat protection that keeps you safe from malware, trackers and malicious ads. If you're still not sure what you need an app like this for, let me mention that they have more than 5,000 servers all over the world and you can choose one. This allows you to access websites in other countries by using a server located there. So if a video or website is blocked where you are, that's an easy way to solve the problem. You can make use of our special offer if you use the link nordvpn.com slash Sabine or the coupon code Sabine. NordVPN is super easy to use, runs on pretty much all platforms and installs in a minute. You can combine it with a password keeper called NordPass and a secure platform to store and share files called NordLocker. If you get them all together, you'll get a better price and they all have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash Sabine or the coupon code Sabine. Links in the info below, so go check this out. Thanks for watching. See you next week.